All right, it is five o'clock, so I will call to order this meeting of the Finance and Personnel Committee. We will begin with the roll call. Uh, Elder Feldy? Present. Elder Flicky Paneski? Here. Elder Perella? Here. Uh, Elder Ackley is excused. Uh, Mitchell's here. That gives us a quorum. Will you all please stand and join me in the pledge? All right, looks like a lot of familiar faces in the room, so barring any objections, we will skip over item number four, the introduction of committee members and staff and move on to item number five, which is approval of the minutes from our February 13th, 2023 meeting. So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the minutes? If not, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? Chair votes aye, the ayes have it, and the motion passes. We are on to item six, which is resolution number 133 of 2223. A resolution authorizing the purchase of 1214 South 11th Street to assist in infrastructure development for the city. Thank you, Chair. So the council has seen this uh, plan in the past in a report of officer a couple of weeks back. This is the property that the retaining wall is failing um, on the alley and the only real uh, cost effective way to repair this is to remove the house and then come in and retaper that uh, area around the retaining wall. So um, the property owner, that the current property owner is the tenant, so they have purchased the property from um, a previous person. Um, and so the city had negotiated a purchase agreement uh, with them, this document is for $167,000, which includes $112,630 of the purchase price and $50,000 in additional expenses, which we are going to be used for them to move out of the property and find a new property um, and kind of take care of everything in one fell swoop. So uh, the plan is to uh, close on the property no later than July 1st, which would give them time to move out of and vacate the premise, and then we will continue to make their monthly loan payments during that time on the mortgage that they have on the property, and then the final closing statement will reflect the payments that the city has made over this course of time, and we will pay the difference. And then once we get uh, access to the property, then we will start working with the purchasing department and looking at the option of relocating this house, moving it to other city owned property on Indiana Avenue, and then um, allow for the Department of Public Works to come in and do the repairs that are necessary on this alley. Thank you. Questions, comments on this one? Alder Flicky Vineski. Thank you. Um, I noticed the July 1 deadline date. What happens if it doesn't occur before July 1? Um, if they're not out by July 1, yeah. then we will have to, I, they're telling us they're gonna be out. Um, so I'm hoping that that's the case. If not, we'll have to look at some legal ramifications for them not being out. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? If not, we'd be looking for a motion to recommend approval on this one. I recommend approval. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second, then seeing no further discussion. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Chair votes aye, the ayes have it, the motion passes. Thank you. Uh, next up is item number seven, which is resolution number 137 of 2223, a resolution terminating the city of Sheboygan tax incremental district number six, and authorizing the finance director to distribute excess increment to overlaying tax. Okay. We, but I'd like to talk about each one of them. <laughs> okay. Because Roberta's gonna ask me where they're located. I wrote them down. <laughs> <laughs> Did appreciate that there were maps <laughs> attached. All right, then if there's no objection from the committee, we'll consider seven through 12, 12 at the same time and we can talk through each of them before there's a vote. 
Sure, so uh, this is a series of closing out TID districts that we've talked about as part of the city's long-term financial plan. So the first document um, that you have is the South Pier District, and this is the oldest district. Um, this district was created in 1992, I think it was. Um, and had been through a number of changes in state law that extended, extended, extended it. Um, but now the debt on South Pier, I think the last payment was made either in 2023 or 2022 for some loans for developing South Pier. So at this point, it makes sense to move forward and close uh, that uh, district. The time frame was to be closed on uh, January 20th of 2023, but the state is allowing us to included in these this process so it just has to be approved by april 15th the next should i keep going by all means the next one um, is the north 10th street water street neighborhood and this is the area around the kingsbury uh, development and the garden toy factory and along the river in that area um, this district was created in 1997 and could stay open until 2024 um, it's making one uh, TIF incentive payment to the Van Horn development, the Kingsbury Apartments, but there's enough increment in there to allow the finance department to hold that in escrow to be able to make that payment and close this district early. The next one is uh, Tax Incremental District 12, and that's Niagara Avenue, and that's primarily the area where the Grand Stay Hotel is. Um, and it was developed for Grand State and for opening up Niagara Avenue, which was part of the original Boston store parking lot. Um, that district, uh, maximum time to stay open is 2027, um, but it has been sharing revenues with TID 17, which is Indiana Avenue area, um, but Indiana Avenue has seen enough development that it doesn't need to have uh, donations anymore for it, so it makes sense to close this one. Uh, TID 13 is Landmark Square and the Founders Club. It was originally put in there for the Landmark Square condominium project. Um, likewise, that's a donation TIF as well um, to TID 17 and with enough increment, there's no need to keep it open. So the recommendation is to close that. TID 14 is Taylor Drive. It was originally created for the Festival Foods redevelopment of the Walmart um, property back in 2011. Um, and then it was amended to include the development where Meyer is um, that uh, a few years ago. So that district could stay open until 2031. And based on the revenues coming in from the Meyer development, um, it's substantial enough to pay off the entire development agreement going forward. So there's no need to uh, keep it open. So the recommendation is to close this district. And then the last one is uh, TID 15, which was developed for what was Kmart on South Business Drive and now is Pick and Save and now recently is Ashley Home Furniture. So um, that district was uh, created just for development incentives to redevelop the King, uh, Kmart into the Pick and Save at the time, um, has no other obligations and is recommended to be closed. Questions? Oh, there, Fleck, you've been asking. Thank you. Um, the Water Street development, was there not some issue with an easement to the river in the Water Street development? An easement to the river? Yeah, from, from Water Street next to Workers Park. Is, is there some issue there? I don't think so. Okay. Does, is it the Blue Moon parking lot you're talking yes, about? Yes. The RDA is going to take that up at a future meeting, so that'll be dealt with at the RDA. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and another one. Um, and um, the Taylor Drive Festival Myers was that extended to also include the Shopco, or was Shopco? Now it was there? not. We kept Shopco out, and we gave Shopco a business development loan so that we didn't have to take it into the TIF district, so we could get those taxes on the general property tax levy. Perfect. Thank you. Other oh, Hadwin. Uh, thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> so, in closing all these TIFs now, is that 
if someone was asking me why you did that, is that because all the development is already done in there, we can't do anything else in there? Or it's just the fact that we're getting close to the, the last date and we need to get that done? Only one of the districts ha is required to be closed and that's TIF 6, the rest of them, the, de the deadline for closing them is multiple years out, 2027. 20, it's primarily because there's really no other projects in the districts and it, and it will help our long-term financial stability by bringing those properties back on the general property tax levy for all the taxing jurisdictions, including the city. Um, so everybody will see a benefit to that. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is that most of the development requirements that were needed originally have all been fulfilled, so there's really no need to keep them open. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, and again, it's always a good thing to close them early, I believe. Yes, it okay. is. So what is, it when, in the closing of all these TIDs, what is the actual financial number that comes back to the city? D d you know, I wrote them all and I thought, well, maybe he's gonna say TID 6, there's so many, so many thousands. I, I would have to refer to the finance director for that question. It's not dollar for dollar. Um, so there is a calculation that's done in order to come up with that number, but I don't know if you have it. I do not have exact numbers for you today. So it is, uh, state law requires us to, um, it's actually based on the new construction within those TIDs and you can only increase your levy by 50% of that. So it's not a dollar for dollar of what the increment was when it was in the TID. So there's actually a formula on our tax levy worksheet, but I could get you estimated numbers um, at some other point. Yeah, just a guess would be that. And, and uh, I guess my last question, if I can, how many tip districts, how many districts do we have left? We have uh, TID 16, which is the downtown district, TID 17, which is Indiana oh. Avenue, TID 18, which is South Point Enterprise Campus. TID 19 is over here by the river where um, uh, Dulmas Decor is located. Mm -hmm. And then TID 20 was for the Oscar. Okay, thank you. The other thing I would just say to the one of the comments that Alder Heideman asked is one, the next step after this is to do an audit of all of these uh, districts before the state will actually close them and that will then determine the amounts and then what to do with fund balance excess and all of that kind of stuff. But until Baker Tilly, our auditing firm, gets through those numbers, it's hard for us to answer exactly what those numbers look like. Thank you. Alder Perella? Yeah, in fact, my question was about the excess funding and how you, well, in, regardless of the fact that we don't have the amounts, but how will you dis redistribute those? I mean, how do you decide? So if the district has a cash fund balance, it'll be uh, shared with the other taxing jurisdictions based on their percentage of the tax bill or the taxing authority. So it, when you pay your property, when we pay our property taxes, a portion, portion goes to each of them, they would then get paid out that same percentage. So I think ours is 34% or something of the total tax bill. So we would end up getting 34% of the revenues that are left in the fund balance part of it. And I know we had at least when um, when Hellers came last year to uh, to talk about the the TIDs and the TIFs, but would that be possible for you to send us a list of the current TIDs slash TIFs and the description of the um, location, just as yes. you did? Thank yes. you. Roberta has asked for that in the past, so I can just forward her email. That's right. <laughs> uh, any other? discussion on this one? Or I suppose all of these? If not, we'll be looking for a motion to recommend approval on items seven through 12. So move. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second then seeing no further discussion. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Chair votes aye, the ayes have it and the motion passes. And that brings us to item number 13, which is general ordinance number 28 of 2223, an ordinance amending the process for preparation and approval of the city's executive budget contained in sections 2-903 and 2-905 of the municipal code. Good evening. The item before you tonight is, as stated, uh, 
adjustment to the budget timeline and schedule and exactly the process that we follow in order for both the capital and operating budgets. We are looking um, and staff has come up with a schedule that would be more cohesive of a program so capital and operating would be looked at concurrently. In addition, uh, we would like to open up the budget um, process a little bit more to both public and council input throughout the process. Um, we, I've been here for two budget cycles now and I've heard loud and clear that council wants to know things a little sooner. So that was the intent behind the budget timeline you see before you, so I'm open to any questions. I will um, just also mention that um, department heads were all shown this timeline as well and they were agreeable that they could do it with their staffing and everything on the concurrent schedule um, of capital and operating together. And so we just think it would be a more transparent and open process. Oh, there, Flaky Banaski. I agree, I saw this previously and, and I think it's a good idea and it's also a good idea to start the process sooner than we've seen it before. Uh, I would like to point out, and I actually chuckled, there is a grammatical error and the rationale was we want to decrease duplicity. And since duplicity has deceptive connotations and in itself duplicitous, I think the word needs to be duplicative or reduce the duplication. So I will vote for it as long as it does not get passed on to council as duplicitous. Sure, great. <laughs> I think it's in the IFC. IFC. So. But you might want to check the ordinance. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just in the IFC. Okay, thank you. And the IFC will not go to council, right? No. Good. I know it's not information for committee, but. Sounds good. Is there any other discussion on this one from the committee? If not, I'll just give my quick two cents of this seems like a great idea to me, both for having the council more, I guess, involved along the way in the budget process. I'm a big fan of the quarterly reviews as well. Yep. And all of the uh, opportunities that are being added for members of the community who are interested to uh, be here and be engaged and be involved in the process as it's being built. Mm -hmm. Thank you for putting this one together. Right. If there is no more discussion, we'd be looking for a motion to recommend approval. So moved. All right, we have a motion and a second then, seeing no further discussion on item 13. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Chair votes aye, the ayes have it, and the motion passes. With that, we are on to item number 14. Uh, the 2022 annual report for the city clerk's office. Thank you. All right, so the report for the city clerk's office is attached in muni code. We had a very busy year. We had four elections. Our April election saw a tie, which we did a hand count of the ballots, which ended in a tie, so that was a lot for us. Um, the general election saw uh, more than 17,000 voters in the city of Sheboygan cast a ballot. Um, we also had a successful audit of our voting machines after the November election. So that was a busy time for us. Um, the Board of Review was also this year, which was a lot um, more involved process due to the revaluation. Um, that actually ended up being a couple days process when usually it's about a two hour meeting. So that was big for us. And then the last page of the report just goes through the licensing that we administer in our office, which has remained pretty consistent over the last five years. Thank you. Uh, questions, comments from the committee? If not, and I believe I usually ask for the wrong motion on these, we'd be looking for a motion to file. So, I was looking for the city attorney to get a nod, and I see that he's disappeared from his chair, so. I think it's just for informational purposes. Indeed. Yeah. Accept it and file. So moved. Second. Accept and file. All right, we have a motion. Second. No action. Yeah, I think it's just discussion. discussion. Oh, we don't. Oh, need action. oh you're Thank right. You Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, even trying to be aware that I was going to get it wrong, I still did. Thank you. Thank you. 
We'll move on to item number 15 that we won't take any action on. Uh, <laughs> the 2022 annual report for cable TV. Okay, thank you. So once again, this was also attached in the Munich code documents. We'll just go through some of the highlights. <clears throat> so number of programs produced, we had a goal of 500 and uh, hit 606. We'll be increasing that goal in 2023 to 625. Uh, we fell far short on our public service announcements. We had a goal of nine and produced zero. Uh, we need to do a better job of, I guess, finding opportunities to produce those. For our production of the <clears throat> Common Council meetings and the Committee of the Whole meetings, we had a goal of 29. We did 32 with the addition of some special meetings last year. Um, significant improvement if you look back to 2019 when we first moved into City Hall with all the new equipment in here uh, that we have here. We've uh, finally uh, mastered it, if you will, and uh, appreciate the equipment that's here. Um, On-demand viewing and unique visitors. If you look at uh, 2019 and 2020, you see a significant drop off going into 2021 and on. They changed the way in which they record that. So that's been pretty stable. Um, if you look at the number of film awards, we received last uh, three last year, we had submitted 10 entries, uh, kind of out of our control, but uh, I know the previous year we had seven, which was a good year. And we've added the YouTube subscribers and YouTube watch time hours, we have found that that is the most dominant viewing plat platform for our meetings and public or, uh, live events and rebroadcast. And you can see we've uh, continued to grow that number year over year. Questions, comments? Elder Flicky Paneski. Thank you. Uh, what sorts of things have you done for PSAs Previously, I'm going to defer to Scott, Scott because he is the man. We, we have worked with Scott. We'll need you in front of a microphone. <laughs> oh, first he has to put himself on TV. Uh, in the past, we've worked with department heads um, to do um, public service announcements for any number of things. We did a number with the uh, police department in the past about uh, scams. Um, okay. we, we had a, and, and that's been a number of years ago. Um, but they did a whole series of the most common uh, scams that were uh, prevalent. Uh, we've worked with the clerks. Uh, office in the past to uh, recruit for uh, election workers. Okay. Um, so th th those are some examples. We did a longer one with uh, um, Public Works on Emerald Ash Borer and how we were treating that and you know, make, make the public aware, you know, why are these blue dots showing up on trees, uh, things like that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Scott. Any other discussion on cable TV? If not, I'll just say that it was great to see that uh, of the Common Council and Committee of the Whole meetings, we have missed none Thank now you. for two years in a row. Great job on that. There's no action on 15. I haven't forgotten. We'll move on to 16, the 2022 annual report for the IT department. Okay, thank you. So for our uh, average close time of critical or high IT tickets, we have a goal of uh, half a day and our actual was 0.41. So we continue to uh, hit that mark. And our effectiveness uh, percent closed within the time frame. our goal was 90, we did 95. So uh, I thank my staff, they do a very good job of being responsive to the requests that come into the department. Efficiency maintain the core server network at current minus one level of firmware. Uh, we had a goal of 100%, we're about 99%. It kind of goes up and, up and down, obviously, as some of you may know, uh, firmware can change fairly quickly and 
we have a lot of uh, servers that we need to stay on top of. <clears throat> Percentage of uh, computers with FortiGate client installed, and the FortiGate client is basically our antivirus that sits on the endpoints. Uh, that is at 100%. In 2023, we'll be adding another measurement, which is, uh, in addition to that, is it's EDR, or endpoint detection and recovery. Um, we put that on at the end of 20, I'm sorry, at the beginning of 2023, we're rolling that out, so. Just another level of uh, cybersecurity protection. Number of uh, legacy applications retired, we had a goal five. We only did two, um, but we're poised well for 2023 to get some fairly heavy usage off of the legacy system, the IBMI. And system availability, we had a goal of 99 and uh, we hit the 99%. Uh, legacy applications retired. We, we moved a small portion of some taxes off of the IBMI, but looking forward into 2023, we're looking at moving uh, the remaining taxes off from that system, special assessments, clerks, business licensing, DPW, the inventory module with their introduction of their EA, EAM ViewWorks application, and then the sidewalk, cemetery, and parks and recs. A couple major accomplishments in 2022. We did upgrade our ERP system, Tyler Muniz, from version 2019 to 2021. We also upgraded all those servers from version 2012 to 2019. Um, we did uh, implement credit card processing. Actually, we, we actually worked on that and then turned that on in the beginning of January, I believe January 10th. And since that time, we've taken right around 1,000 payments for credit uh, through the credit card processing. So that's been a very, very big success. Uh, we supported the new, <clears throat> or the infrastructure at the new Uptown Social Building. So we were fortunate enough to use some ARPA dollars. We were able to get them connected to our sink fiber ring. Uh, and they have a very good, solid infrastructure there now. Um, we continue to work on our cybersecurity, which are basically the last uh, couple of items so, any questions? Questions, comments from the committee? Elder Flecky Panaski. Thank you. If I gave you a magic wand, what one thing would it do that would just make your life easier? <laughs> wow. <laughs> so that's a great question. He's going like this. Uh, yeah. I can see you going like that. Um, you know, when I... I when I look at what keeps me up at night is uh -huh. cybersecurity and those issues. That being said, we are we continue to do a very good job of implementing new solutions and getting the funding for those. Um, I know at some point, uh, Caitlin and I are working to see if we can come and get some ARP funds to cover some of the expenses that we uh, in incurred last year for some of the cybersecurity upgrades that we had. Why don't you share the fun fact that you shared it really underscores oh. the importance of this. Yeah, um, we have a email filtering system. We actually we have two. Um, so I'm well aware. The, yeah, <laughs> the first one catches the boulders and the second one catches the pebbles. Um, but uh, we, on a weekly basis, will see attacks uh, against our uh, email system, usually from like Ukraine or Lithuania or some foreign country where we receive literally tens of thousands of emails trying to infiltrate our system. So I know we were talking about that with the mayor the other day. So um, we, we see those things. We do see on the perimeter a lot of people trying to access or get into the city thus infrastructure one way or another. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? If not, just one or two for me. Did we move servers off of Windows 2012, or Windows Server 2012? Yes, those would have been uh, uh, the Windows Server operating system. We, we, we actually had some on 20 or 2008 as well that we, move, we moved. Um, these were 
basically the Munis servers that I'm referencing here, but we did move, I think, an additional seven or eight servers other than the Munis servers from either 2008 or 2012 to 2019. And we have a handful more yet to do this year. Okay, I'm glad to hear that we're moving forward on those. Then just one other question for me, or from me, rather. Uh, the number of security audits performed, looks like we didn't have any outside audits this year. Is there a plan to do that in 2023? Right. We opted not to do the one last year just because we had so many new cybersecurity enhancements we were putting in place. We wanted to get those fully implemented and um, understand where we needed to tweak those a little bit more rather than just having an organization come in and say, you need to do these things. We knew the, knew the things we wanted to do and needed to do, so we've done those. So the plan is to have one in 2023. That makes sense to me. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, last call on IT, any other comments from the committee? Mm -mm. Thank you. Thank you. With that, then we're on to item 17, which is the 2022 annual report for the municipal court. Hi, thank you. So you should have a copy of my report and uh, it has a nice little summary of what we've done for the past five years. And so you can see that for 2022, we were pretty much back on par with the number of cases that we handled um, to what they were prior to um, the, the pandemic. So that was quite quite the difference, 6,600 in 2019. We dropped all the way to 5,043 in 2020 and now back to 6,500 again uh, for 2022. We added um, a line under collections for restitution. So previously we didn't report on that, but that is something that I think is important just to show that the court not only um, collects forfeitures uh, and funds our department plus other initiatives in the city with that, but we also collect restitution. And so what might be interesting for you to see is that um, in uh, 2022, even though the, the forfeiture amount ordered was roughly $200,000 less than what it was in uh, 2018, the collections were almost exactly the same. So um, I think that's a reflection of our, our staff which are highly efficient, um, able to to um, process and handle collections in, in a better way and then get money back to um, the citizens and restitution. And so we have had um, consistent staffing. So for 2022, some things that are not on um, as readily available with numbers or just knowing other things that we're doing at the court. So last year I was able to reinstate our truancy workshop and that's been a partnership through the Sheboygan Area School District um, where once a month I meet up, meet with up to 80 kids working on our truancy issues that we have, um, which are uh, pretty shocking. I think that we have a crisis for truancy right now. For our elementary school kids, we're at 8% uh, truancy. For high school, we're between 20 and 30%. And so the truancy workshop was something that I had uh, been able to start with the school district right before COVID, and so we were able to reinstate that last year. Um, we also have two new two new programs that I'm working with. Um, one, South High, I've started a restorative justice program. And so that would um, be working with students to look at um, offenses that they're um, involved with at school and how it affects the whole community and then and maybe how they can adjust their behavior um, in, a, in a different way than just having a forfeiture or having even sometimes community service, but to actually sit down and, and analyze what they're doing. And then also um, working with the school district on um, more citations for parents uh, for contributing to truancy and then having a workshop um, that they would be able to participate in lieu of that citation. And that's really the only way that we're able to get at that 8% elementary school truancy rate um, at the municipal court because I can only see kids once they're 12. So any any kid under 12 is not coming through. Um, and so there is an ability to have a citation for contributing to truancy, but there had been a reluctance to use that in the past because the minimum forfeiture for that is $376. And so schools were, you know, maybe a little reticent to go that way. But now that we have this project where they can avoid that by going to um, a workshop put on by the school district um, 
social workers to look at uh, why contributing to truancy, why not having your child go to school is so bad and can have a big impact on their life, um, I think is really important. And the school district is also providing child care and a meal for these families. So it's, it's a great program. Hopefully more, more families will take advantage of. Thank you. Questions, comments, Elder Perella? I just was curious about the numbers of the Sheboygan building inspections, department cases that went down. Is just because of the way that maybe they have been uh, tracked, recorded? No, this is, this is just how, no. This is what they're doing. So this is just the, the cases in which the inspect, the, um, whatever the inspector, the inspectors have mandated to owners, landlords, that then come to you, or it's just what they have, what owners have not paid? That These are the on? ones that come to me. So this is looking at the total number of cases that the court processes. Right, so which cases would they be? So for building inspection cases, is typically what, what I'm seeing cited are for issues where people are not maintaining the property. So it could be um, that the roof needs to be fixed, foundation issues, windows, um, paint. So those types of cases are typically what are going to be reflected in that number where it's saying building inspection cases. So this is something that I've talked to in the past. Um, significantly or, or extensively is that I have no control over how many tickets the police department writes or building inspection. Um, I have no control over how many tickets Kohler writes. All we can do is handle them as they come through. Right, so that means, in other words, that number reflect perhaps just a lesser amount of citations that the inspectors have, the inspectors have issued. Correct, that's okay. what that is. Thank you. But um, you can see then, you know, Village of Kohler has been writing more citations. And um, the police department issued, you know, 1,200 more than the year before. And that's why it, it kind of just balances out. So, so it does fluctuate. Oh, there, Felthy. Yes. Um, I applaud you for working with the truancy program. Thank you. Um, I think if we catch them early, um, we can avoid some of the problems later um, in their middle and high school years. So I applaud you for that. Thank you. I guess I'll piggyback on that. I was going to say the same as well outside of just the numbers in the report. It was great to hear all the work that you've been doing with the school district. It, Thank you. I was very surprised to hear 8% and 2230 for elementary and high school. So I'm Glad that this has been a focus. Do we have any other discussion from the committee? No. Nice job. Ah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Next up we have 18, which is the 2022 annual report for city development. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So what I handed out was a printed version of this because a lot of times I get calls for a printed copy then you don't have to come back and get it. Um, so this report is made up of two divisions. Uh, the city development division is made up of planning and development and building inspection and we'll talk about some of Alder Perella's concerns about building code cases as we move forward. But um, just kind of paging through this uh, talks about some projects that the department has worked on. I'm not gonna read them to you, you can take it on your own, but we continue to obviously focus on housing as our number one uh, concern. So on page three, um, there's been some starts of some new subdivisions, uh, uh, Indian Meadows mobile home park expansion and then the purchase of the Gartman farm in 2022. On page four, um, TID district updates. So we amended TID 16 to provide development incentives to the Sheboygan Press project that was talked about at the council meeting last week. And then uh, the Shopko redevelopment to redevelop that into Hobby Lobby and Ross Dress for Less. Uh, Ross Dress for Less is open and Hobby Lobby is planned to open sometime in the beginning of April. On the next page, there's some additional commercial developers, uh, development, scooters, coffee, Ashley Home Furniture, Nature's Best. Um, a big one was the Old World Creamery addition to allow them to uh, start manufacturing cheese with a byproduct from butter. 
and the Redevelopment Authority gave them a $500,000 uh, loan to create 20 new permanent jobs. And then the last one is a number of you called me about this project, 832 Michigan. This is a kitty corner from Trillings Hardware. Um, that old building that had been vacant for a lot of years will become a dermatology clinic. On page seven, um, the old Salvation Army is now good as gold appliance outlet. Um, and then in the BMO Harris building on the corner of Superior and Taylor, uh, Third Coast uh, Vascular renovated the upper floor in that building. On page eight, the Sheboygan County Detention Center is expanding in the city's uh, first business park. And then on the bottom of page eight is the multi-tenant spec building that's just started construction, the first tenant in the South Point Enterprise campus. Um, and that project is coming back before you because it's already expanding and they're gonna take on some more land and put up a few more buildings for the tenant that they received. So stay tuned to that. Um, on page nine, interagency co cooperation, we hosted the city's first Make Music Day um, on City Green. Um, we hosted the uh, Sheboygan Housing Coalition series of town hall meetings on affordable housing. Um, as part of the block grant program, contributed 40,000 to the All Abilities Purple Octopus Playground at the uh, Above and Beyond Children's Museum, and then worked with a number of city departments organizing the annual Rock the Block Habitat for Humanity revitalization event. On page 10, after three or four years of uh, trying to get federal funding from the Natural Resource Damage Assessment, which was related to the Sheboygan River Cleanup Project. The city received $196,000, of which $176,000 went to replace a deteriorating bridge at the Evergreen Park Area 5, and the remaining uh, roughly $25,000 will go into adding some additional fishing bump outs um, along the Kiwanis Park later this year. Um, we also celebrated the opening of the city of Sheboygan's first solar field with Alliant Energy on city land that's being leased to this, from the city. Um, and then we updated our Title VI plan um, related to the civil rights and implemented the city's language line and educated all of the departments um, on how to use language line services for translation uh, for the different populations in the community. On page 11, um, we laid out the first pianos for placemaking. I'm not sure how that's gonna end up. Some of them have weathered the storm and some of them have not. Um, and then worked with the Department of Public Works and the mayor's office on upgrading the alley, uh, be basically across from Stefano's or next to the Trotteria to try to encourage uh, people to use the public parking lot and feel safe going through the alley. Um, and then worked with Public Works on the demolition of the Social Security building across the road and added a dog park for downtown pet owners. Um, this year we also launched through a uh, call for artists on page 12, the utility box revamp program. So we uh, wrapped 12 boxes with artists' works around the community. Um, a couple weeks ago, we had the Armory documentary at the uh, Wild Center. Um, we're working on a project to receive a grant from AARP to wrap the mayor's old van. So we're gonna be wrapping that in vinyl graphics and it's gonna become a public engagement vehicle where it can go into neighborhoods and um, excite people and get people ener energized and provide comments and those types of things. And then on that page, the last thing was there was a mural done on Indiana Avenue with a local artist. On page um, 13 uh, is the block grant funding list that we also administer on behalf of the city. Um, we had on the bottom of that page, we had a new nonprofit come forward this year called Flawless Hoops, which is providing basketball mentoring and uh, training for all ages. Um, a program that's been developed by Cedric Foster, um, and he's looking to expand this program, and it's worked very well for kids to have a place for after school activities to learn uh, the sport of basketball and get some mentoring along the way. Um, on page 14, we continue to administer housing rehab funds for the city. 
Um, we've implemented a new program called the Upper Floor Residential Rehab Program, which takes vacant store uh, fronts and upstairs second floors and converts them into housing opportunities. So you can see um, there's some transition of some of those projects. And then we also have a facade and landscaping program that we use to target um, houses along key corridors to try to keep them um, landscape and updated and their front facade looking good. On page 15, a couple downtown um, his, uh, remodels of, of properties that were huge in, in kind of helping with our overall downtown revitalization program. And then shifting gears on page 16 is the building inspection department. You can see on the bottom chart uh, five, year, five years of the collections and the uh, number of permits issued. Um, so looking at the total revenues uh, generated from permits, it was about 947,000. In 2021, it was about 996,000. So it was a little less. Um, some of that has to do with interest rates rising and this timing of large projects, but we're optimistic that it'll get back on track this year. Um, under permitting on page 17, it just shows you the number of uh, single family housing, uh, duplexes, multi-apartment and multi-condominiums uh, uh, projects that have been built over the past five years with the 2022 at the bottom. And then last but not least is code enforcement. So one of the questions was the numbers. So what, you're, what you see in those uh, hexagons, the nuisance complaint statistics and the housing complaint statistics. So we're still issuing on the same amount of orders that we have in the previous years. I think now we're getting to, people are being kind of understanding what this program is about and working with our inspectors to get to compliance or trying to obtain additional housing resources from us so that they don't have to be cited. Um, so that's why you're seeing a decline in the number of citations and the number of court filings, which I think is a good indicator that people are investing in their properties and if they're getting identified for code orders, they have the uh, resources in order to make the improvements and they don't have to be cited to get them to do the improvements. So that's, I think, where the number is. I mean, it, it's less there, but it's also less from a city staff point of trying to prosecute those um, code orders. And then we continue to hold landlord training twice a year. Um, we've probably done uh, trained over 300, 400 landlords. Um, we do a spring and a fall one uh, in partnership with the police department. And then on the last page, there's a picture of all of the folks within the department um, and their titles. And we're here to help if anybody has any questions. Questions, comments from the committee on the report? Oh, there's like you've been I want to know what you do in your spare time. <laughs> this was really impressive. Thank you. Any other discussion? If not, I will second uh, Alder Flicky Pineski's comments and just say thank you for the printed copy right off the start. Uh, 19 was the 2022 annual report from Uptown Social. If it's okay with the committee, we'll hold on to this one until the next meeting. The director could not be with us tonight and would like to give that report in person. If there are no objections, we'll move on to item 20, which is the 2022 annual report for the finance department. Thank you. Uh, the report is in your packet, so I'll just go through it real quick. So the finance team did have some changes during 2022. Um, when I first was hired in 2021, we had a couple vacancies. So those were left open intentionally for a short time to make sure that we could staff accordingly um, to what we needed for the department. So with that uh, little bit of reorganization, we did become fully staffed in May of 2022. That lasted until October. So we do have, um, the payroll specialist and deputy finance director both left at the end of 2022, but I am happy to report that we are fully staffed as of last Monday again. So we um, are good on the uh, finance team front. So for our 2022 accomplishments, um, the much talked about chart of account conversion finally did happen. Um, all of the uh, testing and the coding that went into that took months of time, but we did go through and 
it got posted, I believe it was official in July. Um, so we did get that completed. We were reconfirmed by Moody's as a AA2 rating um, for our credit. So that always is helpful when it comes to the debt issuance. That is the best rating that the city of Sheboygan um, as a municipality of this size um, that we can get. We did change audit firms and we went through our first full audit with Baker Tilly. Um, as you may recall, there were challenges um, through that process. We did have the uh, presentation of our 2021 done at the end of 2022. So we're hoping to have that to you earlier this year, of course, um, getting through those bumps of a new auditor and new finance director. Um, hopefully this year is smoother. Um, I mentioned before that we align the job tasks differently in the finance department. Um, I will just give a basic um, informational, I guess, of why we did it this way. So we have three individuals currently in the finance department who we would call the doers. So we have them, they're doing the um, data entry and con a lot of the actual data into our MUNA system or making sure that it's getting imported correctly, things like that. And then we have the two reviewers. So we have a grant auditor, grant accountant and internal auditor. So his job is to make sure that we're doing it the right way. So we have procedures and policies in place and um, my goal is to have more come forward later this year. But his job is to make sure that we're doing it the correct way. And then we have a financial reporting analyst to make sure that the numbers are true to what they should be. So we have to make sure they're right and how we got there was correct. So those are the best practices within the accounting and finance world. So that's why we did that realignment of duties. Additionally, we had the five-year financial strategic plan come forward with Ehlers last year. And uh, we're hoping to have that kind of a living and breathing document and updating as we need it to um, in order to keep up with our TID closures and opening potentially in the future or any large developments, things like that, or projects that the city needs to consider. Uh, the FEMA, uh, one of the first projects that the uh, grant accountant did was actually work with the state um, of Wisconsin through the FEMA program. That windstorm that occurred back in June, we actually were eligible for reimbursement due to the significance of that storm. And we actually just got back the uh, report. We're getting $240,000 reimbursed of those expenses. So that was, he, um, Austin hit the ground running with that project right away. We also implemented a new debt and lease tracking software, which is DebtBook. So uh, the accounting standards changed quite uh, significantly when it comes to leases, and it's a very much accounting heavy, and we um, have this software to help us um, become more, um, make sure that we are compliant with those new requirements that are um, put out there for us. We did contract with a municipal debt collector um, to assist with delinquent bill collections. They already have done significant work with our ambulance billing company, and we are working on making sure the rest of the delinquent personal property after this collection cycle was just done to make sure those get to them as well. We also uh, started and, well, continued uh, putting together uh, the capital asset listing. So one item that came up during audit is that our capital assets or all of our machinery, equipment, buildings, vehicles, all of those types of things are, the way we were tracking it was not up to, I'll say my standards. So we um, have been working hard to make sure that we're getting all of the listings and doing a full audit of all the assets that we have on our books to make sure we do still have them and that they're valued correctly. So we're um, working on finalizing those numbers ahead of audit. Uh, additionally, we uh, implemented with the assistance and um, teamwork of with the planning department, in, implemented the host compliance software. We did start that in 2021, but we had some hiccups on their side with um, staff transitions, as uh, everyone knows um, is common nowadays. So we were able to finish that implementation and have been working through the permitting and collections um, in that software. And lastly, I did um, just list that uh, we provided human resource department uh, assistance throughout the year. I will, I wanna give uh, a shout out to my entire finance team because all of them are more than willing to uh, jump in on any type of task at any time. So they're the ones that kept me uh, moving forward uh, throughout the whole last year. 
Some key metrics, um, one item that I really wanna point out is our accounts payable checks and ACH. So um, in 2020, we had about 6,000 checks that were issued and we did not have ACH in place at that point. So each check, I believe this, the number that comes to mind is it costs like $35 to issue each check, but for ACH, um, it costs less than a dollar. So when we look at 2022's number, it actually checks are now at, for 2022 were 3,400 and accounts payable ACH was just at 2,000. So there's a significant switch to, um, and movement to that ACH payment option, which is both more secure and also um, just reduces our cost overall as well. And you can also see that there are credit card payments process, which increased about $350,000 during 2022, and the taxes collected by the city um, during the first installment was $54.4 million. So in a matter of about seven weeks, that's a lot of uh, transactions that go through this, the finance office. Um, the next page on the report is just showing exactly how much is uh, collected by each area. So City Hall collected 43.7 million dollars of that 54 million. And then um, we appreciate that the three Wisconsin Bank and Trust branches in town do also help us collect as well. So they collectively collect, uh, collected about $10 million. Lastly, for the 2023 goals and projects, um, Munis is where finance uh, does all of our work pretty much. So we have some uh, projects that we hope to accomplish in 2023, including implementing the project ledger. We have received some training and guidance from Munis on how to implement that. So now it's just moving forward with that step. We did need the general ledger conversion to be done before we started the next project ledger. So now that that is done we and we're fully staffed again, we can make sure to uh, get working on that. Additionally, with the capital asset listing that has been put together, we want to import that into Munis, and I can't tell you how excited I am about that because you can depreciate everything in a click of a button, so it will save a considerable amount of time for both finance and the auditors when you have the proof right there too. Additionally, we are hoping to get the bank reconciliation process within the system. We are looking to import city credit cards, so the cards that actual that employees actually use. We're hoping to get those transactions to be imported into Munis so that they're hitting our accounts um, in the system sooner so that department heads have a better track of where everything is going. And lastly for Munis is moving the special assessments and delinquent personal property taxes out of the AS400. I will say there has already been a significant amount of work done on these. So we're hoping to have those um, out of the AS400 within a few months. Additionally, the um, city is hoping to assist uh, Sheboygan County. We've already been, uh, we have already volunteered to help with the implementation of a web-based property tax collection software. This was um, being planned originally for 2022, but due to technology um, holdups, it, it's been pushed to 2023. So I'll be contacting them probably in March to make sure that we're uh, moving ahead with that because that again will help significantly during that December, January timeframe where we have all of these um, entries for tax collections. It will actually make us more efficient because I'm hoping it um, we can have that available to import payments so that we're not hand keying every single one like we are right now. Additionally, I mentioned that we were going to be looking at adopting um, updated financial policies. Those have been in the works and we just are going to bring those forward for consideration at this committee and discussion. And the last item on our goals and projects is developing the new budget process for increased transparency and um, having additional council and taxpayer input. So we discussed that a little bit earlier today and we just wanna make sure that that is also a moving um, document or breathable breathing document just to make sure that we are really getting what council wants from staff and also that the taxpayers feel confident in the budget process moving forward. So I'm open to any questions. Going to resist the urge to ask if there was a monolithic single Excel file for capital asset tracking and just open it to questions from the committee. <laughs> well. Go ahead. 
Thank you. Um, may I congratulate you and your department? And kind of like I said, what do you do in your spare time? And the other thing is that we are well aware that you were wearing and your whole department was wearing two hats. So this is an impressive list. Thank you. I second that one. <laughs> we have a second from Elder Fowley. <laughs> Any other discussion? Elder Perella. Just, <clears throat> just two brief uh, curiosities. So you said that the accounts payable SCH um, Obviously, I mean, I, I, that's, um, uh, that's always good, obviously, instead of, instead of checks. But you said that the check cost, we are talking about the payables, right? You said the check cost $35. Why is that? So the bank actually is the one who estimates that cost. So between actually issuing the checks, making sure that we're doing reconciliation and all these extra steps, including the check stock, we actually send reports to the bank of every check we issue to make sure that it's um, being approved properly and things like that. It's just a lot of extra staff time to issue a check compared to an ACH. So not only is the check stock, that's pretty cheap when it comes down to it, but it's more staff time to actually issue checks than what, what it does for ACH. Yeah. So it is the staff time that is included. <laughs> and then finally, you mentioned the bank reconciliation, right, process. What did you say about that? Sure, so currently we're working bank reconciliations through, I think it's about six different spreadsheets in Excel. Mm -hmm. So Munis has the uh, capability to import bank transactions. So we're hoping to, we did have one Munis uh, training day to learn how that exactly worked and try to figure out if it would work with our bank that we currently have. And it does appear that it will work. So what we have, we have quite a bit of legwork we have to do before we can actually get it in, to import correctly because we have years of data in Munis that won't have bank transactions that match it because we're so far ahead of that. So what we're hoping for is to have that import and so it's a lot less manual uh, calculation and it's matching one for one transactions between Munis and the bank. I didn't even know that that was possible. That's why I'm curious because we do the, I do the same thing, so. Yeah, yeah we have, I think we're up to 10 different bank accounts, so, and that's not even including our investments. So it's just a lot of tedious calculations and, and when it's in Excel, there's of course always the um, opportunity for errors. So we would like to get past that and get it into Munis. Thank you. Good idea. Any other discussion on this one? If not, thank you, Director. All right. Our next regularly scheduled meeting will be on March 13th of 2023. And with that, we have exhausted our agenda and are looking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn. Seeing no discussion on adjournment, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? Chair votes aye. The ayes have it. The motion passes. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.